Bridges are a cornerstone of today's modern life. Just look at any city and you'll be surprised at how many you can count, whether it be over water or valleys or just other roads. Although they might seem easy and simple to construct, the physics and engineering that bridges require is actually pretty complicated. When designing bridges, you need to take different forces into account. A force is a push or pull in any direction in which a change is produced. The force can be weight, wind, air resistance, or even a moving vehicle. Before we look at the design of bridges, it is important to understand the forces that are applied to the bridge and how forces never act alone. As stated in Newton's third law of motion, it is not possible for a single force to occur because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Engineers must consider this law of motion when they design a bridge because the bridge will react to wind, moving vehicles, or even earthquakes, although it may not be visible to the human eye. When forces are applied to a structure and added together, the sum of the forces is defined as a load. Two types of load engineers must consider when designing bridges are known as dead and live loads. A dead load, also known as a static load, includes the weight of the bridge or stationary objects on the bridge. A live load, also known as a dynamic load, includes objects in motion as well as natural forces such as the wind or an earthquake. Live loads are most difficult to design for because they are always changing. It is crucial that engineers account for all types of loads when designing a bridge because the magnitude of loads will affect the material selection and possibly the type of bridge engineers choose to build. To accommodate for variations in dynamic loads, engineers design for maximum live loads using specialized software which can generate many calculations before building materials are even considered. For all forces acting on a bridge, there must be a counter force pushing or pulling in the opposite direction. These forces are defined as either compression or tension forces. A force of tension will lengthen or pull on a material, while a compression force will squeeze or push a material together. A bridge member under tension, compression, or both forces at the same time experiences what engineers define as stress. Stress is a measure of how hard the atoms and molecules which make up the material are being pushed together or pulled apart as a result of external forces. Stress is not associated with any particular length or cross section. When referring to stresses, materials can experience different types. Forces pulling on a member will cause tensile stress. Forces pushing on a member will result in compression stress. And when both forces push and pull on a member, and the lines of forces are not directly across from each other, a shear force is produced. The elongation or shortening of a material under stress is defined as strain. Strain is a measure of how far material is being pushed apart or pushed together, and like stress, it is not associated with any particular length or cross-section of a material. The amount of stress a member can tolerate is crucial when selecting materials for a bridge. Engineers analyze every component of a bridge to determine what members will be in tension, compression, or both. Engineers must keep in mind that certain materials are better under compression rather than tension. These include concrete, brick, hardwoods, and steel. Some materials such as steel, flexible yet strong, can carry tensile forces. There are also materials that can carry both tensile and compressive forces. Pre-stressed concrete is one of these materials. Pre-stressed concrete has steel rods running through it so it can withstand not only a compression force but a tension force as well. There are four main types of bridge, beam, arch, truss, and suspension and different bridges can be made using a combination and variations of these. In order to build a beam bridge, also known as a girder bridge, you, all you need is a rigid horizontal structure, a beam, and two supports, one at each end to rest it on. These components directly support the downward weight of the bridge and any traffic traveling over it. However, in supporting the weight, the beam bridge endures both compressional and tensional stress. An arch bridge utilizes the arch as its main design as this bridge carries its weight outward along the curve of the bridge to the supports at each end. The supports, known as the abutments, carry the load. The abutments also keep the ends of the bridge from spreading out by creating two equal and opposite horizontal forces that push inward on each other. Arch bridges rely primarily on compression because as forces are carried outwards along the curve of the arch, the molecules of the material are compressed. When selecting a building material for an arch bridge, engineers must consider only materials that are strong under compression. These materials include stone, concrete, or steel. Trusses are like a beam bridge because forces are transverse to the axis of the whole truss. A truss is identified by its series of triangles that are connected by a lower and upper cord or flange. Forces are carried along the axis of the assembled members that form the shape of a triangle. The members of the truss carry forces of tension or compression, but not both. Bending occurs when both tension and compression are acting on a member. Members which hold the deck 
for the cars, trains, people, bikes, and other objects crossing the bridge are subject to both tension and compression. The last type of bridge to define is the suspension bridge. This type of bridge can be easily recognized by its large pylons, those tall towers that rise out of the water, and the cables that hold up the road deck. Some examples of this type of bridge are the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and the George Washington Bridge in New York City. The cables are attached on top of the pylon and then pulled down in a parabolic or catenary shape down to two anchor points on land. One disadvantage to a suspension bridge is its reaction to the wind. This was discovered in a little accident during the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State. Engineers learned new things about suspension bridges, like that the roadway itself does not have to be rigid, but should flex when loads go across it. The flexes of the road are designed with intolerable limits in large structures. The solution to keep the road stable and stiff is to add a larger truss below the deck so that the wind approaching the bridge would be resisted more easily. Beams, arch, truss, and suspension bridges are a very basic way to categorize bridges. There are many other types of bridges, like cable stay bridges, which look like a suspension bridge except that the cables come from the center towers. There are arch bridges that utilize suspension cables to hold the road deck from an arch, and many more designs that can be applied for different applications. Now back to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Many people think that the bridge collapsed due to resonant frequencies, but it actually didn't. A resonance is a vibration driven by a force oscillating at a similar frequency, like the electrons in an antenna oscillating at the same frequency as radio waves, or the glass oscillating due to sound waves, but that's not what happened at the Tacoma Narrows. The wind speed that day was a fairly constant 40 miles per hour, so it was not a wave or a resonant frequency. The phenomenon that actually caused the bridge to collapse is something called aeroelastic flutter. The same thing happens when you blow over a piece of plastic or paper. With enough wind speed, the bridge started to twist a little bit, but tension in the bridge caused it to swing back to its starting position. But it did this too far, allowing the wind to push it in the other direction, but more aggressively. This pattern continued until the bridge collapsed. This phenomenon also causes airplane wings to hum and vibrate. Bridges are a great tool because they help us get from point A to B efficiently and easily, but they're actually cool because of all the awesome physics that's behind them.